Dawn? Well, welcome. We're, it's, after, it's the afternoon session of the public day. Uh, my name is Bernard Siegel. I'm executive director of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation and the founder and chair of the World Stem Cell Summit. And we are in the afternoon session of our public day. So as you know, the sessions from our grand ballroom are being live streamed around the world at worldstemcellsummit.com. This topic is really of interest to me personally because I find the whole concept of frozen zoo, the fact that we might be cloning the north or cloning or saving from extinction the northern rhino, and all of the esoteric, interesting, popular culture aspects from the technologies that we have today are sort of brought home with the, with the individuals that we'll, I will be introducing uh, for, this, uh, for this session. Uh, one of uh, the speakers is uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jean Loring from the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla. And uh, Jean is a member of the Science Advisory Board of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation. Uh, her work is exemplary in all aspects of the field. She's also a commentator on the policy issues and, a, and an advocate's advocate, a Parkinson's disease advocate, uh, someone of extraordinary talent. And she's also lent those talents to the, to the Frozen Zoo. Also, we have Oliver Ryder of the, the Frozen Zoo who is here with us today, uh, which is a fascinating project. So this is an opportunity for those that are uh, in the room and live stream to, to learn more about this exciting project. So I'll leave it to both of you to uh, present the session. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Good job, guys. Um, so what you see on the screen right now is uh, NOLA. Uh, NOLA was the last of the northern white rhinos that lived at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. This was a film taken in, uh, a few years ago. Um, she died in 2015, and you'll see what the consequences of the, that is in a moment. She's a northern white rhino. There are currently, uh, it's, it's, they have been hunted almost to extinction. In fact, they are practically extinct in, in the wild. And um, they've been hunted for their horns, which are made of keratin, which is the same thing that your fingernails and hair are made out of. So the, the idea that this keratin comes from a rhino imbues it with magical properties that makes it very popular, especially in the, in the Far East, as a, a medical um, and other, and also for decorations. But the consequence is that animals like this are becoming extinct. So I'm going to introduce the idea, since this is a stem cell meeting and I'm a stem cell biologist, I want to let you know what my connection is um, and stem cells connection is to this northern white rhino and the issue of extinct species. Um, just to give you a little bit of a review, the first, uh, first pluripotent stem cells were uh, yeah, it does. It doesn't really work. The first pluripotent stem cells uh, from humans were derived in 1998 from discarded embryos. Uh, they use the same methods that have been developed in 1981 to make mouse embryonic stem cells. So we've had the concept of pluripotent stem cells around for a very long time. Um, what made a huge difference and made stem cells a lot more useful than they had been was the advent of reprogramming technology. In 2007, Shinya Yamanaka took some skin cells from a human, reprogrammed them into uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, which are, in fact, exactly the same as embryonic stem cells. Uh, these cells can vary from each other, but they're in those, those variations are trivial. They still have the ability to make all cells Uh, the root of a tree and all the branches and all the cell types that you can make from those pluripotent cells by following a particular pathway. And finding that particular pathway is really the challenge that we have now in order to make cells that will be useful for clinical use and also, as you'll see, for, um, for conservation use. And you'll notice down here, the, the, in the lower 
left-hand corner are gametes, which is the key to using these cells for, um, for restoring uh, endangered species. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about is a, is a collaboration that started in 2008 with my friend Oliver Ryder, who is the director of uh, conservation research, the Frozen Zoo, at the San Diego Wild Animal Park, as it was known then, now called the Safari Park. Um, and what uh, Oliver had been working on for much of his, his uh, life was uh, freezing specimens of animals before they died, after they died, collecting them from all over the world, and cryopreserving them in a way so that they would be still viable. And as you'll see from the map on the right, uh, we're only about 30 miles apart, so it's not a really very long drive for me to go up to the zoo or for Oliver to come down to my lab. So we figured that if you could make pluripotent stem cells from humans using these reprogramming factors, why couldn't you make pluripotent stem cells from other animals using the same methods? So that's what we did, and surprisingly, we found that we could use exactly the same methods, that is using the same, the human genes that are used for reprogramming, they worked on northern white rhinos. So that was a surprise, obviously, and it laid the groundwork for everything that's come since. We published this work in 2011, I'm trying to keep track of the dates here. 2011 we published this in Nature Methods paper, and uh, as you'll see we got the cover which is essentially an ark filled with all those animals that we're going to be trying to rescue. Uh, this work was done by a postdoc in my lab called Inbar Friedrich Ben Nunn. We took cells from the frozen zoo, we thawed them, they're fibroblasts from skin, we reprogrammed them, and we came up with uh, pluripotent stem cells. And the stem cells look very much like the human pluripotent stem cells do, and they stain with some of the same markers, some of the, the same um, markers that tell you that the cells are pluripotent. In this case, I'm showing you nanog, which is a nuclear protein, which is typical of pluripotent cells. And they had a normal karyotype, and normal for a northern right rhino is 82 chromosomes. So we had the karyotype done on, on three of the clones that we ob obtained from uh, this culture, and they all were pretty much normal karyotype, although there are a few variations, which is another subject, I think. Okay, so we started by um, reprogramming cells from Fatu, who is the lower, on the lower um, left-hand corner. She's the youngest of the animals. We thought that might be an advantage. It turns out it doesn't matter. But uh, as you'll see, when we, uh, that is not good. Can you turn off my backup, please? <laughs> Wasn't supposed to be doing that. So well, I was, uh, so when we, thank you, uh, oh yes. All right, we're moving forward. <laughs> There's always something. Okay, so we're, there we are, thank you. So the, um, when we did the, uh, in 2008, when we first started the project, there were eight northern white rhinos in the world. There were two of them at the San Diego Safari Park, two in the Czech Republic, and then um, some, a, a group of uh, four others that had been transferred to a special reserve, a conservancy in Kenya for their protection. And then by the time, um, by now, there are only three left. The, the three that are left are, are two females and a male that live in the, um, in the conservation um, location in, uh, in Kenya. So, and a lot of them have died recently. As I said, Nola, the one, our local northern white rhino, died in late 2015. This is the conservancy. Um, you can see there are three guards for this one rhino. That's necessary because poachers still want these rhinos in spite of the, the fact uh, that they're harder to get to than the other rhinos in Africa. So the next thing that happened really was in 2005 when we had a conference organized by Oliver Ryder and a colleague of his in uh, Germany, Thomas Hildebrand, 
uh, in order to get a bunch of people together to ask whether we might be able to use these technologies, like stem cell technologies, to restore a species. Um, and the, um, the meeting was held at one of the oldest zoos in the world in um, Vienna, Austria, in the winter. Um, and it's really quite lovely to have, uh, I guess the people at the zoo are used to this, they get to have meetings at the zoo all the time, but those of us who are lab bound don't normally get to go to conferences at zoos. So it was, it was really interesting and the people there were extremely diverse. Um, this is some of them. Um, this is, uh, this is what we call the scientist exhibit, which is a temporary exhibit at the zoo. It was only there for the time that we were there. Um, and that is one of the original cages. And interestingly, a very, and also very efficiently, um, this group put together a publication, which is published in zoo biology. Um, I had not published in zoo biology before. But it uh, was remarkable because the editor did not send it out for review, for peer review. He decided to accept it as is. And that's never happened to me before, so I thought maybe I should be publishing in zoo biology more often. Um, but it was really, uh, we, we talked about the, the whole process, which I'm going to leave to Oliver to tell you more about, about how we could start over on the left there with, um, with rhinos, and on the bottom you can see the pathway for going from uh, rhino skin to um, induced pluripotent stem cells, and there from them there to primordial germ cells, to gametes, to embryos. So we're started on the path, we're at the first step. Um, I wanted to introduce Oliver. We've had a long-term collaboration. You can see in this picture, Oliver is the one standing up. I'm the one uh, in the white hat. And this is one of the last pictures we had taken with Nola at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. Before, before Oliver comes up, I want to show you something that you could have. You could have a picture of northern white rhino iPS cells on a t-shirt. And I especially like this front part. And that's an actual micrograph of the, of the northern white rhino cells. Oliver. Thank you, Jean. Um, it's a pleasure to come here to talk to this audience. It's uh, a new one for me. Most of my meetings are in zoos. Oh, zoos yeah. and, um, this is my first trip to uh, West Palm Beach. Um, but uh, stem cells have changed my life because I believe they are changing the possibilities for what I want to work on, which is conservation. Um, let's see, I advance the, the green button. So this is a picture of a northern white rhino in the wild. Uh, in Garamba National Park in what was Zaire, now Democratic Republic of the Congo. It died, we don't exactly know how, but most likely at the hand of man. Um, there are none left there. It was a sentinel, it was a, it's an emotional image for those of us who work on saving it. Imagine, this is what we would like to see in the future, is to have these rhinos back in the wild but they are basically functionally extinct now. But uh, Jean Loring mentioned the frozen zoo. And it's a small room, but maybe a very, very important one. It's important to save cells for conservation applications, and the frozen zoo is a collection of living cell materials, early passage, diploid fibroblasts. Our collection is the most extensive, most diverse, uh, best characterized and most utilized collection of its kind. We have cells from approximately 10,000 vertebrate individuals that represent a thousand species. It's contributed to hundreds of scientific studies. Um, studies such as naming species, describing the tree of life, and for using, for managing uh, small populations. Uh, those are the, some of the conservation applications, but one of its major uses has been in human medical research. 
The greatest users of the frozen zoo are researchers at NIH, Howard Hughes investigators, investigators at medical schools, who want to understand the evolution of the human genome, the evolution of our physiology and the, our susceptibilities to disease. So they ask us for samples from uh, uh, animals, many of which are endangered, and we are a uh, contact point that can provide these kinds of samples. The fibroblasts, as I said, uh, we have uh, uh, different orders of, most of the samples are mammals, uh, but we have uh, birds, it's the most, one of the most rapidly growing uh, sessions are birds, reptiles. We're the only place in the world, I think, right now that's banking viable amphibian cell cultures. Amphibians are under a great conservation threat. It's uh, suggested by the World uh, Conservation Organization, uh, IUCN, who publishes the red list that 30% of the amphibian species of the planet are in imminent danger of extinction. We're going to want to study these animals, study their diseases. We're going to want to do that in vitro. We're going to need cell cultures. And uh, so we're trying to establish methods to bank them. They're not as easy to grow as mammalian cells. Um, and then uh, we also have my colleague, Dr. Barbara Durant, uh, has been saving sperm and uh, reproductive tissues. And uh, she also has a very extensive collection. Um, we have uh, frozen tissues and DNAs. So it's a really a very remarkable resource, one that we've used, as I mentioned, for many conservation studies, but we always knew that it would be used for things that we didn't yet appreciate were going to take place because of scientific advances. And, and one of the most, the two of these that are most remarkable to me was learning about Dolly, which meant that we could turn the cells in the frozen zoo into animals, and then learning uh, about uh, uh, the report of, out of uh, Shinya Yamanaka's lab that fibroblasts could be turned into induced pluripotent stem cells. So at that point, Gene and I uh, started to, uh, to work together. So the idea is that if we can turn these cells into animals, can they be used for genetic rescue? Well, genetic rescue is a real phenomenon that uh, is known. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, to uh, produce the, uh, uh, in, a, the uh, increase the robustness of small imperiled populations via migration. It's usually been accomplished by moving an animal into a population uh, that's uh, genetically uh, diminished. And uh, the Florida panther in this state is a case in point where that species was on the brink of extinction. A few females were brought from Texas. They were allowed to reproduce. They were removed um, and kept in captivity for the rest of their lives, but their young caused a resurgence in fitness, we call it, uh, of the population. And so the population is growing now. The major threat now is they're being killed on the roads. So genetic rescue is a real phenomenon, but uh, could it be done with cells? Well, in some extreme cases, um, Genetic rescue may depend on, on uh, uh, access to viable cells from appropriate individuals. And the northern white rhinoceros, uh, Nola here, uh, who you've already met, is a case in point. And it's a subject, this project is a subject of an enormous uh, commitment by my organization, the San Diego Zoo Global, a, uh, a, a nonprofit uh, zoo. Um, and uh, that has two campuses, the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, and also has the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research, where I've worked for 40 years. Well, commitments are also being made by others, like, like, like Gene Loring, and, and so uh, we have a growing effort to try to prevent, to use advanced genetic and reproductive technologies to prevent the extinction of a species. Well, you ask, well, what are we talking about? This is the northern white rhinoceros. Is there a southern white rhinoceros? Well, yes, there is. The southern white rhinoceros went through a genetic bottleneck a century ago. As few as 30 uh, individuals uh, uh, remained. And um, the, uh, uh, 
Uh, the northern white rhinoceros is at the headwaters of the Nile. And um, uh, uh, so how different are they? Well, that's, I was asked that question in the mid-1980s, and we did the first genetic studies on northern white rhinos, and we could easily see they were different from southern white rhinos. More recently, we've said the way to really find out how different they are is to sequence their genomes, so we've done that for eight northern white rhino individuals from the cell cultures and uh, southern white rhinos and done a comparison. And we now know that they are really distinct evolutionary diverged populations differentiated at the subspecies level, which in some ways is a good sign because they're much more, because in order for this project to succeed, it's gonna require having surrogate mothers. And those surrogate mothers are not gonna be able to be northern white rhinos. There's no female northern white rhino that's capable of carrying a pregnancy. So we're gonna use southern white rhinos as surrogate mothers for northern white rhino embryos. And I'll tell you a little more about how we plan to do that. But first, um, here's a little more detail about the history of the samples that we have. We have eight unrelated individuals. The three surviving individuals are in the orange, uh, shaded in orange there, that are, have been uh, removed uh, to the old Pejita Conservancy. Um, in Kenya, but you'll see there a father, his daughter, and his granddaughter, and I mentioned the females are not really capable of carrying a pregnancy, so this is a species that's, that's doomed. It's, it's, it's alive, but it's functionally uh, extinct. Um, there may be a hope of collecting ova from these females, and there's a lot of effort to discuss how we might do that in that uh, remote location. So the meeting in Vienna uh, just over just a year ago that over a year ago that uh, Jean Loring mentioned produced this roadmap that my colleague likes to say looks like traffic in Los Angeles at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, but it's. It's an effort to, to construct all of the possible ways that we might be able to reach the goal. The goal being a self-sustaining population of northern white rhinos. Now, are those cells enough to do that? Well, when we sequenced the genomes, we looked at their uh, genetic diversity at the DNA sequence level and compared it to southern white rhinos. And the northern white rhino, the genetic diversity is, well, first of all, it's more than humans. There's greater SNP density in these rhinos than there is in humans. And there's a comparable amount in the northern white rhino cell cultures um, as exists in the population of southern white rhinos that uh, successfully went through the bottleneck that I mentioned before and grew to 18,000 individuals. So we believe if we can get to uh, an interbreeding population of 30 individuals, there's no genetic reason why they shouldn't be able to expand their numbers um, and uh, uh, successfully, as did the southern white rhino. So the overall goal is a self-sustaining population. To do that, we have to produce a, the first northern white rhinoceros calf. To do that, we're going to have to have an embryo transfer, to, as I mentioned. And to do that, we're going to need to have surrogates and we're gonna to need to have northern white rhino embryos. So one of the ways that I'll focus on to make those embryos would be to use induced pluripotent stem cells to direct them to primordial germ cells that would then make sperm or eggs depending on their chromosomal constitution. Those materials would be the source of uh, zygotes uh, for uh, um, embryo uh, maturation, embryo development and maturation, and then transfer into the surrogate females. So um, this is a plane that brought um, surrogate females. We had to charter a plane um, uh, to uh, bring uh, six rhinos to San Diego. And um, they uh, arrived and got a police escort to the safari park and uh, in, in the middle of the night and um, uh, they uh, uh, do the floodlights, loaders, crates, and biosecurity uh, lights and everything remind you of any movie? Well, that's just my colleague's dramatic 
over representation. This is, we're not gonna use the Jurassic Park word because that's, that's not, don't tell them that. That's not what we're, that's not what we really wanna emphasize. What we wanna emphasize is that uh, this is a, uh, uh, an, a uh, we wanna focus on the science because all of the efforts of traditional forms of protection, traditional forms of husbandry and trying to propagate these animals in zoos have failed. And now it's down to scientific innovation to make the difference whether a species survives or not. So these are the females um, that we brought, six that now have been uh, at the safari park for about a year. They are aged now, aged now between about four and uh, 10 years old. And um, we are, they are being trained. They're not, be most of our rhinos at the safari park, which is, a, if you're not familiar with it, is a very large facility. It's uh, over 900 acres. And one of the enclosures is the size of the whole of San Diego Zoo. It has mixed species exhibits. We have rhinos in there with multiple other species. And these rhino, and the, uh, the animals behave in a very wild way. But these females are being treated in a very much different way. They're being trained with positive reinforcement only. And um, uh, they, um, they are, we constructed a facility, uh, it didn't work. It, uh, we constructed a facility for them uh, that was put up very quickly um, uh, where they uh, live outside and uh, because the weather's good in, in, uh, in Escondido. And, um, uh, and, they are, and we have a, a very talented staff of keepers and trainers that uh, work with them. Uh, uh, and it's right after they came, they were given uh, reproductive exams. We brought in the world's experts in rhino reproduction and in advanced uh, reproductive technologies uh, 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 and uh, did um, uh, ultrasound exams to uh, uh, de determine their reproductive status. And we could see that the females were cycling. Uh, they had ovarian follicles. And, and uh, that started our baseline data collection. Now what we're doing, or what's been done, incredible work over the past year. Can you click that for me so, it gets the, so the video gets going? Is to train the females for reproductive monitoring. Rhinos are really very intelligent and white rhinos are social animals and our keepers have been able to train them um, using standard methods of animal training to walk into this uh, uh, chute that uh, can give us, uh, can protect us, if, uh, or not me, but, but protect the people who are the reproductive physiologists to, and veterinarians to do exams on unanesthetized animals. So uh, w the animals can be, will, will uh, on the, of their own volition, come into a crate. You can see this being given a target and uh, she approaches the target, gets a, a bite of hay. Um, they love, uh, they're very food motivated and they love to be petted. And uh, so uh, um, we now are uh, doing, um, have learned a great deal about uh, these females and their uh, reproductive cycles. And uh, we, um, one, of, one of my colleagues, Dr. Uh, Parker Pennington, is getting ready to do a, an ultrasound exam on a rhino. And uh, she, she does this now, basically, uh, all of the females are getting, re, uh, getting ultrasound exams, basically, uh, almost on a daily basis. So those represent an enormous effort and investment to provide this surrogate uh, gene pool. And we're gonna, because the domestic horse is the closest relative, the closest domestic species to the rhinoceros, we're gonna take information that's used in the domestic horse reproduction industry uh, for, for like collecting um, ova and uh, doing uh, embryo transfer uh, methods because nobody's yet done an embryo transfer in a rhinoceros. And nobody's tried because we really haven't had many rhino embryos to work with. So um, we have partners in South Africa, um, and uh, because of the dire situation for southern white rhinos now, the extraordinary poaching pressure, um, 
Uh, there are uh, ranches that have rhinos uh, in high security zones to protect them, but what that means is that they're, very, is they're closely managed. You can't really say they're living in the wild. They're living in a, uh, in a, in a very uh, high security compound. And um, some of those animals are made available for our research um, efforts and uh, uh, contributes, to this, uh, contributes to this project. So um, to bring you a little more up to date now, um, the publication that uh, Gene Loring talked about from 2011 used, used lentiviruses, viruses that integrated to make the stem cells. Uh, uh, colleagues in, uh, in Gene Loring's lab, uh, Dr. Marisa Carodi and Tom Nguyen, uh, are making um, stem cells now using uh, non-integrative methods, using Sendai virus. And uh, we have uh, stem cells now from more individuals. Our goal is to make stem cells from all 12 individuals and then proceed with the in vitro uh, development. I have to acknowledge the incredible team of people who've been banking cells and who are the world's expert on culturing uh, mammalian cells. Um, uh, we um, uh, just have this amazing collection and its diversity, and uh, this work wouldn't be possible without them. We have a growing collaborative network that's very encouraging. The Scripps Research Institute and the uh, San Diego Zoo are, have been has started the scientific collaborations for animal resources. It started with a zoo in the Czech Republic, and uh, over time these relationships have just uh, proliferated, and we now have colleagues in uh, Japan, in uh, Shinya Yamanaka's institute, and uh, this is proceeding in, in a dramatic way. We learned earlier today about um, uh, uh, how uh, teaching children about um, cells can uh, be, you know, can broaden their educational perspective, and I think that that's really important. You know, cells are life. Every organism, whether it's a single cell organism or a multi cell organism, begins its life or lives its life as a single cell. All of the experiments of biology that have produced the diversity of life forms that have lived on this earth, all of those experiments have taken place in cells. And to be able to bank those cells and use that. Uh, knowledge uh, for conserving biodiversity and for uh, remediating some of the losses or that take place in individuals, uh, the, the diseases, or take place on the, in the biosphere in terms of loss of species is just an amazing activity that this is the first time in the history of life on Earth that that can be done. Thank you. We have, time. we have time for just a couple of questions, but I did want to point out again, if you are interested in rhino iPS cells, this is an actual photo of a colony. It's one of the first colonies that we made. And you'll see that there's a little cutout on the other side shaped like a rhino. There are also puzzles available that have, uh, they actually have little rhino shape. Um, the people from Illis who talked this morning are responsible for making these shirts. They're responsible for providing them to you, and they also have available um, instructions, at least, about how to get some of the puzzles that are made out of these photographs, these photo micrographs. So do we have uh, one or two questions? No. Yes. yes. <laughs> Could you go to the microphone? Sorry. Is there one over there? Hi, I'm Christina from Virginia Tech. Have you had any success in generating gametes out of these iPS cells? Well, gametes, um, the quick answer is we have not. But um, in the mouse, it's, people have gone from a fibroblast to iPS cells to primordial germ cells to sperm and eggs um, to produce uh, in vitro embryos that were transplanted into surrogate females that gave birth to pups that grew up to breed normally. So that's what we want to do. We want to do with the rhino what's been done with the mouse. Our major uh, 
we have major uh, hurdles or Challenge. major challenges that we have to face, and um, because of the you know the lack of knowledge of, of reproductive biology and uh, of rhinos, and and a big one too is they have a 16-month gestation period, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> more or less. Yeah. So I just want to I just want to point out that all of this started with mice, um, 1981, first mouse embryonic stem cells. So and then. The next thing that happened, which was remarkable, was the, the human iPS cells. But then I think it's remarkable that we discovered that we could treat the rhino cells just like human cells and reprogram them with exactly the same genes. And that was a real breakthrough for us. Yes? Um, I just wondered about the northern white rhino and if there is a habitat left if you succeeded in this venture? That's a great question. People say, like, well, what about, could you put animals back into the habitat? The unfortunate thing about rhinos is that they've been selectively removed from their habitat. Their numbers are down 99%, 99.9% in the last 50 years. There's plenty of habitat for them. They've just been removed. So making secure habitat for them will require um, political stability and um, probably high levels of protection. Um, but I think that we ought to embrace the notion that that's possible. And um, it's likely to be encouraged by if we would uh, have animals available, we could say, you know, now we'd like to see these go back. There's another question. Oh. A question here. Can you imagine like a cascade process where like you're using the southern whites as the surrogates for the northern whites, that there might be like an eastern white or western white that is not compatible to have the southern as the surrogate, but maybe the northern, so that you do a cascade process to sort of go further back in lineages to get really extinct species back? Ah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question, and we don't know a lot about surrogacy. We know about hybrids that have been able to be made in the history of breeding animals. Um, we know something about the evolutionary tree, the phylogeny of, uh, of, of rhinos, and the northern white rhino and the southern white rhino are diverged probably uh, 100,000 years ago. The closest relative is the black rhino, to them is a black rhino that's more like eight or nine million years. Um, whether they're going to be like placental incompatibilities, um, that's an area of, of uh, important area for research to see uh, how far it might be extended or to see whether. Um, modifications can be made to, to make some species more likely to be able to be surrogates for other species. I see. And another question, like, how scalable do you think this might be able to be? Do you think there could be recovery at some time and efficient methods for recovering of thousands of species? Mm -hmm. It's really good to do it for the one, but what about for the thousands of others? This is our example. Do I do it? I Jean wants to take the question. <laughs> no, it's all right. We're very compatible. Um, we see this as the, um, the, the first of many. Um, as I said earlier, I think Oliver chose the species because this is one he's very fond of. And it's obviously been a very evocative sort of animal to try to bring back. But there are lots of animals that are, are becoming extinct. And if we can make iPS cells and primordial germ cells from them, if we can go through the whole process of surrogacy, then we should be able, this could be a, a normal technique, normal conservation method. Thank you. Can I just add on quickly to that? Yeah, I suggested the northern white rhinoceros, not because it was going to be the easiest, but no. it was very clear to me that this was the only way to prevent its extinction. The fast uh, progress will be made in for endangered species that are closely related to domestic species whose physiology and reproduction we understand well. And we have a number of candidate projects um, in mind, but our hands are full right now with this one. I think we better wrap it up. Thank you very much. Um, if you want a t-shirt over there, on, uh, oh, right there. We have we have another.